Hello, everybody. Good evening. Thank you very much for joining us on this uh, presentation. So my name is Sylvie uh, Watikum. And just as uh, Carol said, I am a PhD student at the University of Tsukuba. And I'm at the Department of International Public Policy. So this is my final year and I've been doing research about uh, African migrants in Japan. And today I am going to share a bit with you about my research. I'm also going to share a bit with you about my country. But before we get to sharing about uh, my country and my research, I'll tell you a little bit of information about myself. And of course, later, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. So this is, this is me, <laughs> a very fun picture. I am the first in a family of three. And uh, there you can see my younger sister, my younger brother, and my mother, my dad is not there because he passed. So it would be better to just put the three, uh, the four of us here. And my hobbies are collecting art. I love, I love, I love art. And I love visiting museums. And the languages uh, that I speak officially are uh, English and French. So if there is anyone who also has questions in French, it is okay, you can answer and we can maybe practice English as well as we can practice some French if any, so anyone is interested. Okay, so we will start a bit to talk about my country. I am originally from Cameroon. And um, just as you can see there, it's uh, a country that in the next probably 15 minutes, I'll talk about it before we get to uh, the other part of the, uh, of the presentation. So it is called Cameroon. And uh, if you are going to spell it in French, instead of this O, it's actually going to be U. So sometimes it's Cameroon and sometimes it is Cameroon, okay? And then uh, this is Cameroon. It's located, it's a country that is located in Africa. And as you can see, yes, this is the, the entire continent. And this is where Cameroon is located. This in this uh, central Africa towards uh, Western Africa, this is Cameroon here in red. Okay, so I'll tell you a bit about uh, the colonial history of Cameroon. And uh, probably we start from uh, the 1880s. So in 1884, uh, between 1884 to 1916, Germany was the country that colonized Cameroon. Before that, we had like the Portuguese who came and they gave the name Rio dos Camaros. That was like the name that was given originally. But from, from 1884, right through till 1916, Germany was the colonial power controlling Cameroon. If you go to several parts of Cameroon right now, you can still find some infrastructure that was built by the Germans in the 1880s when they came to Cameroon. You'll find some things. And then from 1916 through uh, 1961, we had the UK. The UK was controlling a part of the country. And then still same time from 1916, to 1960, France was controlling another part of the country. So it is a country that has been colonized by three different countries. You have Germany, Britain, and France. So you have the relics of this colonization still in Cameroon today. If you go to check it, you will still see things that were done by the British, things that were done by the French, as well as things that were done by the Germans in Cameroon till today. So. I'll talk a bit about, uh, I just told you all two countries, right? Colonized Cameroon. So you may be thinking, normally when we look at history, it's always one power in a country at a particular time. So how is it possible that it is two, uh, two uh, colonial powers in one country, right? So this is actually the, it goes back to the, the colonial history as well as the flag of the country. When uh, Cameroon, uh, we had like the English speaking part of the country and the French speaking part, they had two stars in the flag. So this is the first, when Cameroon decided that they were going to come together, this was the first flag of Cameroon. And the reason why it had two stars was because one star 
was for the English speaking part of Cameroon, the part that was colonized by Britain, and the second star was by the French speaking part of the country. So it showed that it was two countries that came together and then they had uh, two stars. After a time, after a period of time, the, this, that flag was actually called the Federation flag. Then after a while, it moved to the unity flag, which is actually the flag of Cameroon today. So if you see the flag of Cameroon, you will see just one star here. And this one star is called the star of unity which shows that it was the English speaking part and the French speaking part that decided to come together to make one country. That is why we have now this one star, but historically it used to be two stars. And then uh, a bit of information about the country. So we have 10 regions in Cameroon, extreme north, north, Adamawa, center, east, south, littoral, southwest, and northwest. These are the 10 regions in the country. And as I told you all already, based on the history, we had the English speak, we had Britain and France, the English speaking part and the French speaking part. So if you see this here, you see that we have two English speaking regions in Cameroon and eight French speaking regions in Cameroon. So you see that in Cameroon, you will find so many people who speak more French than you will find people who speak English. And most times when they categorize Cameroon, many people always think that Cameroon is just a French speaking country. But no, they have two regions in the country that speak English. So this is called English speaking part of Cameroon. And then this is French speaking part of Cameroon. And I explained to you all at the beginning that sometimes when people spell Cameroon, they use the U. This is for those that are from the French speaking part. They spell it Cameroon with O with U N. And those from the English speaking part, they spell it with two O's, O O N. That is why you see these two speaking, uh, these two uh, uh, regions here. I am from this part, the Northwest region of Cameroon. That is where I am from. So to, uh, two English speaking parts and eight uh, French speaking parts of the country. Okay, right now I'll talk to you all just about like the general uh, weather of the country so that you can have an idea of what it feels like when you are in Cameroon. First, it's a tropical country. Yes, it is. It is a tropical country and it is semi-arid. So it is a bit dry. It's a bit dry like in the north around here. This is the northern part of the country, right? So it is a bit dry there. And then you, when you are coming down south, you get to see it is humid and then it is rainy in different parts of the country. And of course, depending on where you go, you see that it varies. In the southernmost part of the country, like right down here, it is, it gets extremely, extremely rainy and it gets extremely humid also. Or if you are somewhere around this part, this, this part here, because this shares boundary like with the, with the, with the ocean, then it gets extremely humid around these regions. We have just two seasons in Cameroon. We have the dry season and the rainy season. So these are that is how it changes in the country. We are either on dry season or we are on the rainy season. We do not have four seasons last it is in, in Japan. So I'll tell you all about uh, the population of the country, as well as the average life expectancy. I know that when you look at uh, the, this uh, population of the country in many parts, you see different shapes. Sometimes if you look at the one of Japan, you see that it is an inverted uh, triangle, right? But for Cameroon, it is actually a like a regular normal triangle. That is because the young, the youth population of Cameroon is very huge. It is actually a young country and the average life expectancy in the country is 58.9 years. And it's a country of about 25 million people. And when you look at it in terms of like male and female ratio, you see that it is not that different. It's not the, the difference between uh, the population of men as well as women, it's not that far apart. 
okay and we have this of course as i said it's a very young country it's a very young uh, population not a country but a young re relatively young country but a young population also and then let us talk about the political history. I know that most times when we look at different countries and we have to talk about the politics or the presidents, you will see so many faces as presidents, right? But unfortunately in Cameroon, we have had just two presidents since independence. And we've had one president, this one, his name is Amadou Ahijo. I didn't put his, okay, all right. This, his name is Amadou Ahijo, and he was the first president post-independence. Uh, and if you see here, you see that this is independence of 1960, which means that this was independence in French Cameroon. And English Cameroon, it is 1961. There's a whole history about that. I can explain to you all more, maybe during the Q&A session. But uh, he was the first president of Cameroon uh, during um, the... Uh, after independence. And uh, his name is Amadou Ahijo. And then this is the current president. He has been president from 1982 till today. So I am 33 years old and I have experienced just one president. I do not know what change of presidents feels like in countries because all my life, this has been the person that has been president of my country. And if you all choose to join uh, our culture class, we can go into in-depth details. If you have a chance, please do all to join. And I'll explain some more about maybe the history of this president and how that means for the country, the fact that we've had just uh, two presidents. Okay, and then now I'll talk to you all about the capitals in Cameroon, because Cameroon is actually one of those countries that has two capitals. So we have the administrative capital and we have the economic capital. So the economic capital of Cameroon is called Douala. This is where it is located. This is Douala here and if you see it here you see that it is close to the to the uh, to the ocean so there is a lot of trade that takes place here there are a lot of deep sea ports and things that come into the country so we have this economic capital here called Douala and then we have the administrative capital which is Yaoundé this is where Yaoundé is located or if you see here you can also see this is Yaoundé so it is in this part of the country and uh, Yaoundé is where the president presidential palace is. It is from there that uh, decisions that have to do with the running of the 10 regions take place. But anything that has to do with the economy, it is done from Douala. So it has two capitals. Now I'll tell you all a bit about the economy in, in Cameroon, like what we mostly uh, do there. There's a lot of dependence on agriculture on agriculture. Agriculture is big in the country and we produce, these are the kinds of foods that uh, we produce in the country. So we have cassava. Cassava is something that uh, is produced and eaten a lot in the country. And then this is taro. This is taro. Of course, this is banana, okay, cassava, palm oil, uh, pineapple, corn, and then taro. Right, so banana is actually is, uh, Cameroon exports uh, bananas to different parts of the world and to different parts of Africa. It's an export that the country does. Palm oil also, like the first grade of palm oil, that is, this is actually palm nuts. I don't know if uh, you all know about palm nuts or if you have some questions about palm nuts, but this is how it looks like. When it starts, it look, this is the color. And after a while, when it gets ready, it is this color. And when they, when they harvest it, it's like a huge bunch. Then they have to mash it in order to get oil. So Cameroon produces this. And then we have lots of like pineapple plantations and then corn is very big in the country as well as taro that people grow for like a uh, consumption and then uh, in terms of food in the country oh you know uh, yes this is uh, another part of what we export from the country so we export cocoa Cocoa, cocoa is a big uh, export from Cameroon, and this is uh, this is cocoa 
that uh, is exported. And then lumber. Lumber is actually very big. Uh, it's, part, it's a huge, huge part of our economy because they export this, uh, especially from the southern part of the country. There is a lot of like lumber forests there. And then they harvest this and they export it to different parts of the world. Crude oil also, crude oil. Crude oil is very famous uh, in Cameroon. And then we have coffee. Cameroon also exports coffee and cotton. Cotton is mostly grown in the northern part where I was showing you all that it's semi-arid. Cotton is mostly grown in that northern part of the country. So those are the things that Cameroon exports. And then I'll tell you all now about the food in Cameroon, which when I look at it, it makes me hungry because I'm so far away from home. But this is Cameroon food. And uh, this one, <laughs> it's called Eru. And it is made from this vegetable here. You see this vegetable? When they mix it up, prepare it, it looks like this. So this is the, the vegetable from which this comes from. It is called Eru. And it is famous It is famous in the southwestern part of the country. But everywhere you go in the country, you're going to find this. And I hear that this vegetable is very good. Um, it's a good, uh, proof. Uh, it gives blood to people. So that is why it's famous. Some people just drink it, boil it and drink it like that. And then this is actually taro. This is taro that has, this is the making process of it. So they boil taro and then they mash it in something like a mortar. They mash it, mash it, mash it. And then when they serve it, it's like this. So this whitish part, this is it around here. And then, this yellow sauce that you see here, it is actually made from palm oil. It is made from palm oil. And then now you have different types of things that people like to eat with. You have fish, you have beef, you have skin, you have uh, entries, like different things that people like to eat it with. This is the food from my from my uh, from my hometown, and I miss it all. I miss it all the time. And then this is the other food that is common in the country. This is uh, this is something like a starter. We call it pepper soup. I don't know if you all know chili. This this sauce is very spicy, very very spicy. So people eat it as a starter. They call it pepper soup because pepper is like a sauce that is made from pepper. So this is very spicy. And most people eat it when they go for sports or other things, this is what they eat. And then fish is famous in the parts that have uh, like the ocean, fish is famous. Plantain is famous because this is made, these are like the big bananas, right? In Japan, I've seen them selling, they call it big bananas, but it's actually like plantains. This is very famous. So these are the type of things that people eat in Cameroon. And then let me talk to y'all a bit about religion in Cameroon. Religion, uh, Christian, uh, faith is a very huge part of Cameroonians. And you will find so many people belonging to one denomination or the other. So as you can see here, Christianity is like 70% of the country. Islam, 20%. Traditional faiths, 2%, as well as others, 2%. With Christianity, we can break it down into different parts because in the last decade or two decades, there has been a huge rise in Pentecostalism. And uh, so many Pentecostal churches have come up in Cameroon and they are like a huge, huge part of the, the religion that works around in the country. Just as an example, I remember growing up when I, I grew, I'm a kid who grew up around the church. So my house was like here and the seminary was here, like the Catholic uh, seminary was here. But by the time I was like 15, 16, my house was here, the seminary was here. There was another church here, another church here, another church here, and another church here. So we had like four churches that mushroom just around our house. So that gives you an idea about how churches grew up in, in Cameroon and it became a huge part of the country's um, like faith and people to, till today, these churches are still in existence. Okay, a bit about our culture. This, uh, these are like our traditional dresses on a lighter note. These are our traditional dresses. This is actually handmade. This is like the, uh, the 
they sit down with their hands and they and they sew it in and it takes a long time for them to make those dresses it is called the tar the tar that is how it is called and uh it's very famous each time Cameroon is going for various international events, international games, you will see all our athletes wear this because first it's handmade, secondly, it's very expensive. Third, we wear it only during occasions. Let's say somebody is getting married, we wear it. Somebody graduates from school, we wear it. When somebody dies, we wear it. So we wear it on very special occasions and it's also very expensive it costs it costs a lot of a lot of money to get this and then this is from the the um the economic capital part of the country this is what they wear the women will wear this and then the men have this uh like a cloth that they tie and then they wear it with a shirt and uh, the like a cap that they wear. This has a lot to do with the colonial history of this particular place. So if we can speak more about it, I can explain it to you later. Or, and then this is another dress, uh, a cultural dress from the country. This is from uh, some people that are in the Western region of the country. And the thing is, I've just displayed three here, right? But when you travel through the various parts of the country, you'll see that what they wear and what is famous in those, in those places differ, okay? Okay, our national sport of uh, soccer is very famous, football, we call it football. We call it football, but in other places they call it soccer, but it's very famous. Cameroon used to be really good and uh, some, some, they are no longer good, but they used to be very good. Hopefully they get better with time, but uh, football is very famous in my country. And then famous migration destinations uh, for most Cameroonians. Cameroonians like to travel to France, the UK, Germany, United States, Belgium, and Switzerland. It is, uh, if you look at the first three, you see that we have colonial ties with them. And then the other ones, the United States, it's famous for most countries. And the Belgium and Switzerland, that French link, that French link is there. So they like to travel to those places. Okay, so now uh, I am going to talk to you all about my research, what I do at the University of Tsukuba, which is uh, my PhD project, African Migrants in Japan. So uh, we will start with a little bit of information about, we'll just take a snapshot of how the African community as a whole, not all the countries are represented, but it will give you an idea of how the African community looks like. So we see that here, Nigerians, is the Nigerian community is the biggest. And this is followed by uh, the Ghanaian community, the Egyptian community, and then you have uh, South Africans, Cameroonians, Kenyans, Moroccans. So this is like the top biggest African communities that are in Japan. And if you see here, you see that we do not even hit the 4,000 Mac because if Nigerians are about 3,000 something. So that is like the highest number in terms of the community of Africans in Japan. So my research, I study specifically uh, Kenyans, the Kenyan community in Japan and the Ghanaian community in Japan. Those are the two communities that I am studying. And this is how, uh, like some basic information about the Kenyan migrant community in Japan. You see that if we are looking at their status here, uh, we have about 60 who are uh, married to Japanese, about 182 who are permanent residents in the country, and then 78 that are athletes because Kenyans uh, do a lot of like sporting things. So they come to Japan for more like sport development. And then uh, 74 are here through family and then 160 are uh, through study abroad. So you see that most within the community come through uh, study, st uh, they come here through uh, studying abroad. And then the total number amounts to about 777 Kenyans uh, that make up the, uh, the Kenyan community here. And uh, let's look a bit about how long they have, within the Kenyan community, how long have they stayed in, in Japan? So you see the bulk, 51% of them have lived in Japan for between zero to five years. And then 19%, 
between five to 10 years. So you see 51%, they've stayed here just for, for zero to five years, which means that so many of them, it's not a long time ago since they arrived. Because if we are talking from now till five years back, right? That, that is already maybe 20, what, 20, 2018, 20, 2018, right? So it is not a long time since many of them came, came to Japan. Like those, this is actually from those that I sampled. So let me not, uh, this is not like the, oh, everybody. So this is from those that I sampled, zero to five, um, zero to five years for fifty-one percent of them, and then nineteen uh, percent they've stayed here for five to ten years, and then thirteen percent, uh, ten to fifteen years, and then thirteen percent, fifteen to twenty years, and then two um, percent, twenty to twenty-five and 2%, 25 to 30, right? So you see that it's a very young community here in Japan. And then where do they live? Where, what parts of Japan are they concentrated? You see that when we look at it, it's a lot of percentages, so I'm not going to break it down completely, but I'm just going to talk about the biggest concentrations. So you see 11% are in the Tokyo area, and then 11% uh, also, are in uh, Chiba, they, they, they are in Chiba. And then 8% are in, I think this is, this is Osaka. Yes, in the Osaka area. And then another 8% are in the Saitama, Saitama area. If we see, you, when you look at it, there are other places. There's Kanagawa, Hokkaido, uh, Saga, Shiga, Gumma, Nagasaki, Aichi, Hiroshima, Oita, Fukuoka, Miyagi. But you see that it's not as many of them there as you have in these other places like Tokyo, Chiba, uh, Saitama that is like the highest concentration of them and Osaka. Alrighty, so um, the residency status of most of them, students, uh, workers is actually 53%. So, so many of those that I sampled are workers and then 34% are students. So you have so many workers within the Kenyan community and so many students. Then 11% are business owners and 2% seeking medical services. So it was interesting for me to find out that uh, Kenyans actually come to Japan for medical for uh, medical checkups and they are allowed to stay in the country for medical uh, provisions. I was surprised about this particular finding. And then let us go to the Ghanaian community. Okay, so this is a snapshot of the Ghanaian community. You see that so many more of them are married to Japanese compared to the, to the uh, Kenyan community. Japanese spouse, uh, 276 of them. Permanent residents, 1,174, which is way more than the Kenyans, way, way more than the Kenyans. And then family, you have about, I think this is like 174. Study abroad, 153. And the total number, like all of those, uh, no, yeah, yes, this is actually a general number because this is from the Japan uh, Statistics Bureau is 2,434 of, of them, uh, them here in, in Japan. So let's look at how long they have lived, especially if we are to do compared to the Kenyan community. You see 53% also have lived in Japan between zero to five years. So it is actually a young community and a growing community here in Japan. And then uh, 5%, between five to 10 years, and between 10 to 15 years, a whooping 26%. So you see that within the, Ken, uh, the Ghanaian community, some of them have a good number of them have stayed here for a very long time. But those that I sampled for, for within the sampled uh, population. And then now you see 4%, 2%, 2%, 4% 2 for the other ones. So 20, uh, 20 to 25, not many, 25, uh, 25 to 30, not many, 30 to 35, not many, and 35 years and above, not many. This is 4%, 4 actually 4% have lived in Japan for 35 years and above. And this is actually impressive because when you look at the migration routes, like how they came to Japan, you see that it's interesting that some of the Ghanaians have lived in Japan for up to 35 years. And then uh, the residency status for the Ghanaians in Japan, you have uh, workers, 52%, almost the same like the Kenyans, right? 52%. And then students, 38%. Then you have business owners, 7%. And then you have CEOs. And I was, this is actually a, 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 
a discovery that was very new to me because I didn't know that there were like CEOs of different companies that were Ghanaians here in Japan. And I was impressed to find it. And then some who are retired here in Japan, some of them have retired here. So this was also impressive to find that some Africans choose to retire in, in Japan. And then uh, this is now uh, I'm wrapping up the presentation. So here, here I'm just going to talk about what do they do when they engage uh, the Japanese society in because they live here, they do various things that interact with the society. So they learn the language. This one is broken into different parts, which communities learn the language more and how it helps them more. But what they mostly do is they learn the language. They marry uh, Japanese. You see uh, some of them have uh, Japanese spouses. And then most of them work in different companies around from blue collar jobs to different types of jobs. They set up businesses in Japan. So many of them also have like different type of businesses here. And then they get like permanent resident visas. And then what do they do to engage their countries of origin? This is actually arranged in order of how much they do. Almost all of them within the community, they engage their countries economically, socially, and then politically. Economically, it's like this big, socially like this, and then politically like this. So uh, they do more of economic engagements of their countries and social engagement than political engagements. So thank you very much for listening to my presentation about Cameroon, about my research topic, which is the African uh, contemporary diaspora of Africans in uh, contemporary Japan. So if you all have any questions, please feel free to ask and I am here to answer all your questions. Thank you so much for listening to me.